welcome everyone. I'm Amy Milne and I'm presenting today with my colleague Emma Parker. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Textile Talks event. Uh, be sure to check our website and our partners' websites and social media for registration and recordings for all the presentations in the series. Um, we are thrilled to collaborate with our fellow fiber organizations on this community effort. And before I introduce Emma, I'd like to point out a few buttons on your Zoom window. Um, the Q&A button and the chat button. And you may be familiar with these already, but although you all are muted and your webcam is turned off, we want to hear from you. And we've left some time at the end for a few questions. So please enter any questions you have for Emma in the Q&A area. And we invite you to put any feedback or greetings or technical questions in the chat area. We'll take a brief pause after Emma's talk so you can add your comments while they're still fresh in your mind. Um, and today, Emma's going to talk about one of our favorite quilt topics, the backstory. Emma started working with the Quilt Alliance as a volunteer in 2011. She was finishing up her undergraduate degree in folklore when she came to the International Quilt Festival in Houston on her own dime to volunteer with us for four days. That week, Emma and other passionate volunteers played a key role in helping to record the stories of more than 70 quilters for the Quilters SOS, Save Our Stories, QSOS, Oral History Project. And we were so impressed with her experience and skills that we hired her a year later, and you're about to find out why. Um, so I'm proud to introduce Quilt Alliance Project Manager, Emma Parker. Hello, hi, I'm so glad to be here with you all. Um, I think this is the most people I've seen in several weeks. Um, so not that I can see any of you, but you know what I mean. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our two flagship oral history projects here at the Alliance. It's called Go Tell It at the Quilt Show. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the project and then we're going to watch it in action because I think that speaks best about um, why we think it's important. Um, and before we see a few of the Go Tell It Quilt Show movies, I'm going to talk a little bit about one historic quilt that really illustrates um, why we created Go Tell It at the Quilt Show. So this is, this is the quilt I want to talk about. Um, it's a quilt made in Augusta, Maine in 1863 by Susanna Pullen um, and her Sunday school class, which was mostly young women. Uh, the quilt is currently in the collection at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., um, and it ended up there in 1936, so it's been there since 1936. This is actually the back of the quilt, hence the backstory, um, which I'm showing you first because I want to talk about this idea of the backstory or the story behind a quilt. Um, and also, I really love the backs of quilts as much as I love the front. Um, I'm always asking to see the back. So we're, we're, we're going to start with the back. Um, this is the front. It's a really, really beautiful star quilt. Um, it's made potholder style, so each block has bound edges. And while I think it's a pretty, um, fairly classic, I'm not a quilt historian, example of a Civil War era quilt that's constructed similarly, there's not a whole lot here to suggest that it has sort of a bigger story or a backstory, um, other than the fact that it's just a really lovely Civil War era quilt. What you can't see is that before this quilt hung for many years in the Augusta Main Library, there were about 150 inscriptions written on the quilt. Um, Susanna and her Sunday school group made this quilt to be sent to soldiers as part of the US Sanitary Commission which collected bedding for soldiers in need of it. And on the quilt, they had written all kinds of advice, health tips, riddles, um, inspirational phrases. The block on the right, you can't see it well, um, but it says, united we stand, divided we fall, give me liberty or give me death. So, you know, not so different from something you might write in a quilt today. Um, these inscriptions were transcribed by a family member before they faded. So that's kind of how the museum knew that there once were inscriptions. And not too long ago, special photographs were taken of the quilt that revealed the transcriptions so they could study them further. 
Um, this block, also very hard to read because this is a photograph kind of revealing what is now invisible ink, says, if you are good looking, send your photograph. Direct to the name of the large center square signed EGD, which I love so much because it's so human and it's such a teen girl thing to write on a quilt, um, begging for a picture of a handsome soldier. And it really makes the quilt for me come alive. You know, um, a person made this who had desires and hopes and dreams and fears and they were curious. On the back of the quilt, it currently looks like this. This is a a sort of inset from a photograph of the back of the quilt and you can very faintly see an inscription there and the inscription says the commencement of this war took place April 12th 1861. The first gun was fired from Fort Sumter. God speed the time we can tell when and where the last gun was fired and we shall learn more no more. If this quilt survives the war we would like to have it returned to Mrs. Gilbert Pullen, Augusta, Maine. This quilt completed September 1st, 1863. And incredibly, the quilt did survive the war and it came back to Maine where it hung in the library. And when it was donated um, to, I'm sorry, when it was donated to the Museum of American History, there were two letters from soldiers who had seen the quilt. And one of them said, Dear Madam, I have had the pleasure of seeing the beautiful quilt sent by you to cheer and comfort the main soldiers. I have read the mottos, sentiments, etc., inscribed thereon with much pleasure and profit. And because of that letter, it was evident that this quilt had more of a story than meets the eye. So here's the back today, again. Um, you can't see that inscription with a request to return the quilt. And without the documentation of those inscriptions, we wouldn't have any idea about the journey that this quilt has taken. Um, we couldn't hear that teen girl asking for a photo, uh, or I guess at, at that time, probably a, a tin type or something. Um, and we wouldn't be able to hear their sort of wishes and hopes for a nation at war. This would just be, while a beautiful quilt, um, a quilt like many other Civil War quilts. So I like to start with this quilt because it's a very literal example of a quilt where the backstory has almost completely faded away. Um, and that is what, why we started Go Tell It at the Quilt Show, um, to avoid those stories fading. So in 2012, we had been running another oral history project for some time called Quilter Save Our Stories, which was a long 45 minute um, oral history interview. But we felt like that kind of oral history interview was a really big commitment. Um, and also we were only talking to living quilt makers. So there were a lot of stories we were missing at the time. So this new project is really simple. Uh, we collect videos of one person talking about one quilt for up to three minutes. And it doesn't have to be the person who made the quilt. And the story they tell can be anything. We just ask the teller to tell us something that they think is important about the quilt. And the great thing about the project is that we can get quilt stories straight from quilters or anyone else who loves quilts. Um, there's so much you can't see just from looking at a quilt. And that's what we really are interested in. So I'm going to show a few videos that I think really drive home this idea of a backstory that we've collected since 2012. Um, so you kind of get a sense of, of this project and why we love it. Uh, all these videos are available on YouTube, and I will show the link um, at the end of the presentation if you want to watch them again. Um, they are collected at quilt shows, guild events, um, let's see, other regional um, museums. So in all of them, uh, many of which the videos are quite grassroots, so the sound can be a little uneven, um, but we ask that you just bear with us and we will we'll do the best we can. So. The first thing that when we think about a backstory that I always think about is, um, I'm gonna show two videos that do, I think, a really nice job of describing the work of putting together a quilt. And I know that many of you are quilters, and so you know how many decisions there are that go into one quilt that are not often visible. So there can be a lot of planning, sometimes there's quite a bit of research, auditioning a fabric, um, sometimes you make a whole quilt and then remake it into something else that doesn't resemble that original quilt at all. And there are a lot of stories about those choices and why they were made. Um, 
you know, I think that making that work visible and letting people know that it's not just cutting apart two pieces of fabric and sewing it back together um, is, is really important, especially since quilts are most commonly women's work. And that amount of work, the auditioning, the cutting, the design choices, um, sometimes gets lost. And I think it's, it's really exciting to show that even the simplest baby quilt has uh, a creative effort. So these next two videos, I think, really document how quilts are made of many, many decisions and how people make those decisions. So I'm gonna start with one of my favorite videos. Um, this is Flora Joy talking about her quilt, Frame of Mind. And her enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. And it's a story that starts at a, at a traffic light. And actually we were just talking to someone else who was talking about a quilt that they made um, from an idea that they got sitting in traffic. So I guess it's not that uncommon. Um, this quilt is, is very intricately created and I think all the details of its creation and its um, construction aren't necessarily visible just by looking at the quilt. And also she's made a decision here um, to feature three women and it's interesting to hear her thought process behind how she picked who she picked. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it now. My name is Flora Joy and I'm at the International Quilt Festival in Houston, Texas. And I have my friends and family all around me right here. So, and this is a quilt that I have called Frame of Mind. And what I did was select three women that were important to me and that might be important to viewers at a quilt show. And as you can read here, the inspiration came when I was stopped at a traffic light and the revolving billboards were going around and it was a very, very long traffic light. And as I was sitting there, the idea of this should be a quilt where we can see three faces. But as you know, you can't have a little string going with things revolving and I started experimenting with how can I get the three images as you know if you're standing over there you see Jackie Kennedy if your face on you can see Oprah and if you're from this side you see Mother Teresa and unacquainted people might say this is Geronimo how come Geronimo is in there because they say it looks like that but these are three women who I started with a long list of important women and then I eliminated and I had three left with these because people like Amelia Earhart, nobody knows what she looks like. And so many people, they wouldn't know. So I wound up with this and I originally thought I would entitle this From Politics to Prayer because politics with Jackie, Oprah transmits all of this and then prayer with Mother Teresa. But I finally decided after I worked on this frame, I would call it frame of mind. And so that's where that came in. This has trapunto, free motion quilting, and thread painting in here to put all of this together to make that quilt. This is actually two pieces of fabric. The frame is one piece, this is one piece. I cut a hole in the frame and then poked this pleated section inside and then sewed it right around there and put a backing on it. And so that's how this was born and that took a long time to do, but it was so much fun in the process of trying to get this so that you could see three different images. And I had a barrel of fun, so thank you. So um, I'm going to show one more video that I think illustrates this idea of um, exposing process. And this story is actually one of eight Go Tell It interviews that we collected at the International Quilt Festival in Houston about this same quilt. So one quilt, eight different stories. Um, and there's so much you can't see here, like just how many hands touch this quilt during its making. I think that's not immediately evident because it's so... Um, consistent, but um, this is Dana Lynch talking about making this quilt. And Dana has since passed away, but we are, are so grateful we were able to capture her voice here and in a QSOS interview. So. My name is Dana Lynch. I'm at the International Quilt Festival in Houston, Texas, and I'm one of eight members of the Amazing Eight, a group of friends who made this quilt together. 
Uh, we started the quilt about two years ago when we found um, an inspiration uh, for uh, wanting to make the Aztec sunstone. We thought it was such an interesting uh, design and after we saw the photos of it we found a line drawing from a gentleman who had done a lot of study of historical study about it and so with his permission we increased the line drawing and made our patterns and then um, it was uh, duplicated and then um, the patterns were uh, sectioned off and sent out to each of us to complete. And so we had a timeline. Uh, we tried to follow the timeline and it did very good. It, it kind of it kind of almost fell apart in the end, but we pulled it all back together and made it work. Uh, but anyway, um, my portion of the quilt that I made is this bottom section and it starts at this triangle and goes all the way over to this triangle. So it was this bottom piece. And then after I completed my section as everyone else did theirs, we returned our sections to Carol Moeller's and she put the quilt together. And then it came back to me um, and I quilted it. And so the quilting, um, I thought about it a lot and I wanted it to be something symbolic uh, with lots of meaning. and. Um, it was the inspiration for the actual dragon serpent type thing that goes around it was a tattoo and so uh, the dragon head of store course starts in that corner and the body wraps all the way around and the tail comes off in this corner and then the background quilting uh, was done in stonework just to emulate the original calendar which was stone um, and so uh, we finished it just in time to enter it into the festival this year. Um, the one thing I think that's most important to me about it is the amazing fact that we all met on the internet um, and we didn't even meet each other in person for a long time. And it's been just an amazing journey to, to collaborate and to make something like this happen with people that you never see in the whole process. Um, and it's just, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen unfold and actually come to life. And I'm so thankful. I, I was very sick during the process at one point and it was just, there was always a lot of support and I always felt that and everybody worked together and it'll just be something I never forget as long as I live. I love how she says that they had everything on a timeline and it almost fell apart because that's that's the way it always goes but um, I think an, another category of backstory that we story that we hear a lot when we're collecting these videos is the ways that quilts can serve as a memorial or a tribute. And sometimes this is for an individual and sometimes it's for a community. And sometimes we know for whom a quilt was made to honor and sometimes we don't. Um, the next two videos are two quilts that were both made in a spirit of remembrance and in a spirit of grief. Um, the first I think is a really beautiful example of a kind of community remembrance and reckoning and, and the second is much more personal. So I'm gonna go ahead and start these. So my name is Sherry Shine. I'm from East Orange, New Jersey, and I'm here today. Um, I'm honored to be a part of the Sacred Threads exhibit. Uh, and my piece uh, focuses on, um, unfortunately, the passing of Trayvon Martin. And so I named the piece, uh, Will Justice Be Blind for Trayvon? Because I really wasn't sure about um, when the case went to trial, how everything was going to turn out. And so the quilt is um, whole cloth painted. Um, it has a lot of symbolism in it. I'm very big on that when I'm working. Um, the Skittles actually represent his innocence because he was just going to the store to get a can of iced tea and some candy. And I can remember being a kid and being very excited about going to buy candy, whatever your favorite kind is. And I sort of have Lady Justice uh, sitting and slumped over because I was sad about the outcome of his passing, but even sadder about, um, unfortunately, um, the person being found innocent. 
And I thought about the pain that his mother uh, might be going through and multiplied that times 10. And so that's why she's kind of sitting hunched over. If you look closely as well, the blindfold is not completely covering her eyes. And that is to indicate that I wasn't sure, again, what was going to happen uh, during the trial. I used the colors uh, black and white, and as you can see, some areas are gray, because that is exactly how I feel about racism. I feel a lot of times it's very black and white, and then it can turn into this very gray, murky kind of area that we as people can't seem to figure out. And the flag is just represent representational of the United States and who we are supposed to be as um, a country and um, that we're all supposed to be found, uh, you know, equal and we're supposed to treat each other with respect, humanity, um, grace, those kinds of things. Uh, the quilt is also very much faith-based. Um, the African symbol at the top, the Gina Me symbol, actually stands for strength in God, having faith and believing in God. And these may look like vines at the bottom, but it is another West African symbol that stands for faith as well. Um, I used the clocks based on uh, Norman Rockwell's snail, because sometimes justice can be very slow. And so I hope eventually that things will change in this country and we can see each other as human beings. So um, this next video, as I said, is, is a more personal version of, of a quilt made after losing a loved one. Um, I will note that the start of the video has an intro slide that stays up for several seconds. It may seem like your computer is frozen. Don't worry, it will resolve. Um, but it does, you can hear the audio and there's a single screen that's there just to cover up a little bit of shaky video in the beginning. So just bear with us for the first few seconds. It's not you, it's, it's us, so. Yeah. That's a new one. Um, well, let me try one more time here. If not, we will, we'll share the link for you to watch this on YouTube, but all right. Interesting. Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna move along, and I will um I'll I'll put a link in the chat when it's when it's available. That's very strange, but um, the final category that I wanted to talk about of, of sort of backstories and and the type of backstories that we think are essential to save really sums up all of the things we've said so far, and that's this idea that that quilts have lives beyond their makers. Um, one of the reasons we started Go Tell It at the Quilt Show. Um, is that our earlier oral history project, Quilter Saver Stories, was basically quilters interviewing quilters. Um, but it became very quickly clear to us that lots and lots of people have quilt stories and have relationships with quilts who aren't quilt makers. Um, some of them own quilts, some of them collect quilts, some of them inherited a quilt they don't know anything about but feel very strongly about. Um, some sleep under a quilt every night. And so there were so many quilt stories coming to us from people who hadn't made quilts. We wanted an outlet where we could collect those stories too, not just stories from quilt makers. Um, which is one thing I really love about the project is hearing about people's relationships to quilts from a totally new point of view, whether it's curatorial and it's someone who can really go deep into um, some historical context or a family member who's inherited a quilt and just has loved it to death. I think it's really worth remembering um, that it's not just a quilt maker who has something to say about quilts. Um, this video that I'm about to play I think is one of the best descriptions of the quilt making community that I've ever heard and it actually comes from a non-quilter. Um, we interviewed Susan Stewart who made the quilt that you see here uh, about her quilt at the International Quilt Festival and then her husband was there and we asked if he wanted to talk about the quilt and he very gamely agreed to talk about quilts and what quilting means to him. Um, he's not a quilter, but he's, he's in the scene, you might say. And, and this is his great interview. Hi, my name is Mark Stewart. We're here at the International Quilt Festival in Houston, 2015. I'm in front of my wife's quilt right here. Uh, 
have been asked to, from a husband's uh, perspective, to share a little bit about what it's like to live with somebody while they're quilting. And uh, I have to say, it's great. It's a great world. Um, I think we got involved about 2004. Uh, we stopped by a place and we saw some quilts hanging, and they're magnificent. And Sue had a background in uh, and uh, uh, heirloom sewing, and she says, "I think I can do this." And I have a lot of good faith in my wife. She's a good gal, and I thought, "Well, I bet you can." But I had no idea what it's to be like, what the kind of world it's like here. It's uh, from my perspective, I'm kind of uh, I kind of take care of the cats. I guess that's the best way to say it. Uh, Sue has a room with lots of lights, and uh, kind of had to close the door because the cats like to lay in her quilts. And so I kind of police the cats and uh, and get to every once in a while peek in and see uh, or hold it up and just say, let's see what it looks like. Mm, not too bad. And then uh, she'll go back and do her other thing. So it's it's a fun journey. It really is a fun fun journey. And. Uh, I would recommend to anyone, I uh, would hope all husbands and our wives, if the husband quilts, would be supportive of it. It's just, uh, it's a different world. I don't know how you say it. I think I've told many people it's art, uh, for me anyway. Uh, and the only thing is you use uh, thread instead of, uh, 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 I'm thread instead of paint. I don't know how to say that. It's just a grand life, grand journey. Uh, but it does take, it's, it's a very tedious thing sometimes. And uh, I think, uh, as I tell, I've told many people that come by this quilt, my job basically is to rub her shoulders at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, to have a normal life, whether she's, uh, she's very, uh, has a very, very normal life uh, with the cats and jogging and uh, cooking, good cook. And so I get to uh, the joy of watching it unfold. And I gotta tell you, sometimes I see her start, and I go, what in the world is she making of this? And then uh, there's several years ago when she made a quilt and uh, she had it all done. And then she started to cut holes in the middle of it where she was gonna put lace, but you had to have a done quilt and everything. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's a crazy lady. But it came out beautifully. And uh, so I've been very blessed to be on that journey with her. And I, I uh, think that it's something, but it, support is a very important thing. So that's my, I tell people she has the skills. Uh, uh, that's her gift. My gift is a gift of appreciation. So I can do that. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit of the journey. It's great. We should all be so lucky to have someone so sweet. Um, the next quilt, I think, is, is another really good example of the many lives of quilts and how they can, they can live many, many different stages. Um, I think you'll want to pay special attention to where they found this quilt, uh, which now lives in a museum. Um, it definitely it gives me a little bit of shivers to think about. Um, but I think this is a, a good example of, of talking about a quilt from a curatorial perspective, but also um, a, a quilt where the where quilt maker is not present to tell the quilt story. My name is Melissa Ralstead. I'm the executive director, um, and I am telling my story, quilt story, at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, on Friday, August 17th, 2018. And the quilt that I am talking about is a Mexican rose variation. Um, but the story behind this quilt isn't really the story of the pattern, it's really the story of where we got the quilt. Um, this is one of two quilts in the museum's collection that are known as the dump quilts, um, and that is D-U-M-P. Um, the reason we call them the dump quilts is because that's where we found them. Um, I should actually say that's where someone, the, the person who found them, found them. The story is that um, there's a gentleman looking for a um, toy box for his children. So he went to the local dump, purchased or found a box, a wooden box, brought it home, hadn't looked inside it. When he got home, opened it up, this was one of two quilts that were inside it. Um, so it's a wonderful story of how they actually ended up coming here. Both of the quilts, so this one actually dates probably to about the 1870s, um, between 1870s and 1880s. Um, so beautiful quilt in beautiful condition, but again, found at the local dump. Um, how it ended up here at the museum. Fortunately, his wife realized what he had <laughs> um, and what they had found. 
and um, knew that they couldn't throw them away. So she eventually brought them to the attention of the Wisconsin Quilt History Project and um, brought them here to the museum, um, ultimately. We attempted to find anybody who knew any background or information about them. We did an article about them, trying to say if anybody has any idea of where these came from. Uh, to let us know. Unfortunately, we were never able to find out any additional information, but it still makes for a wonderful story um, and some really just kind of fun and unique things. Now, with this quilt in particular um, and the other one that we've got, we're pretty sure that they were made by the same person because there are some shared elements between the two. The swag um, that goes along, the border of both of the quilts is very similar um, between the two quilts, and they were found together. So tend to think that the quilts were actually probably made by the same person. So just kind of a, a fun story of the dump quilts at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. Um, so by now, I hope that you're reading this and you're just saying, duh, um, that every quilt has a story you can't see. And I do think that's true. Every single quilt has one. Um, and it has, every single quilt has a thread no pun intended, of a story running there that's, that's not visible on the surface. Um, the last two quilts that I want to show you, I think actually eerily resemble each other a little bit, even though they were made many, many years apart. And both of them were sort of important and useful to their makers in ways that may be surprising. Um, I don't think in either case the story is necessarily written down on the quilt. So in, in, in some cases, this video is, is the record that we have um, about the, the hidden story here. Um, maybe wrong about one of these, but we'll see. Uh, the first one is recorded at a, a guild meeting, actually. We visited guilds and did kind of mini documentation sessions. Um, this is from a guild in North Carolina, and the sound, it's in a big church hall, so the sound is a little echoey. Um, I do encourage you to watch it on YouTube if you can't quite catch it all, but it's just a, a tiny bit um, sort of fuzzy, but, but, but definitely audible. Charlotte's Bay, Southwest Way Quilters, uh, Fuqua Verena, North Carolina, March 15th, 2016. Okay, this quilt was made by an elderly Amish couple in uh, Charm, Ohio. Um, I lived in the Amish country for eight years and became very friendly with a lot of the Amish quilters. So one day, one of my Amish friends uh, had just started a quilt shop in her home. She had just become widowed and was very uh, impoverished. So um, I, went, I needed some things and I loved her dearly. She was a sweet lady. Went down to get some things and this quilt was laying on the top of the bed frame in her living room where she had stacks of quilts that were made by the Amish ladies. So I bought my things and started to leave and when I started to leave she said, would you buy this quilt? And I, being very much a traditionalist, I thought, uh, well, I really <laughs> didn't want excuse me, didn't want to, but um, she said, well, this was made by an elderly couple up the street whose stove broke down and winter is coming. They will not ask for help and they need money for a new stove. So they went to the coat factory in Berlin and um, they gave them all of their coat lining fabrics. So they brought him home, and the old gentleman, he was 88, and she was 86. He cut the pieces, she sewed them together, and they quilted it. So my friend, Amanda, said, would you give us $85 for it? Well, of course, by that time, I would have mortgaged the kids to have <laughs> get the money to pay for it. So I, I took it home and uh, put it on the bed upstairs. My husband came home and went upstairs and he said, where'd you get that quilt? And I told him, he says, well, I think you better put it in the closet because I think it'll probably be so loud it'll keep us awake tonight. <laughs> 
so anyway, that is the start, and that was in 1970, 1975. So that is the story of my Amish quilt. And they, they did get their new stove. So, I, you know, I think that's such a great, I mean, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but such a sweet story. And it's a story that only Charlotte um, knows. And a story that, that when, when Charlotte's gone, um, might go with her. And so we're really, we're grateful to have that story of that quilt. Here's our, our last video about um, an, a quilt with an invisible story. My name's Heather Kenyon, and this is my quilt, Scrap Coins. It's called Scrap Coins because, except for the binding, all of the pieces in it were leftover bits that were very small from a very big quilt I made about three years ago um, that was a coin quilt, so Scrap Coins. Um, and I had saved those scraps in a little Velcro bag, or a little plastic bag, because I really loved them. It's all soft shot cottons, but I didn't, I was a fairly new quilter when I made that bag and was like, I don't, these are too little for me to do anything with, but they were too pretty to throw away, so I kept them. Um, and then this summer, I had a very trying summer. Um, it was very exciting at first because I got pregnant, and then we lost the baby about eight or nine weeks into the pregnancy. And we went on a big vacation and almost immediately after that that had been planned for a long time. And then we, I didn't sew for two or three weeks. And when I came back, I didn't want to work on any of the projects I had, but I pulled out all the scrap pieces and I just sewed them together and sewed them together. And then I hand stitched all of this and I've never hand quilted a quilt either. So it was a lot of things I don't usually do happened in this quilt, but um, I really, I didn't think about it at the time because I'd sort of been planning a, a quilt that I drew out on paper and I did eventually make about to, to process the miscarriage, but I really feel like this quilt was completely about my all the emotions that I didn't know what to do with about a miscarriage this summer. It doesn't really, I don't know that you could see any of that there, but for me, making this quilt was about dealing with those emotions. And I finished it in um, October of 2015. And uh, it's February 2016 when I'm filming this. And the same month that I finished making this quilt, uh, I got pregnant with my first child and I'm five months pregnant now. So it has a lot of meaning for me and it getting to go to QuiltCon and be here and, and with um, pregnancy going much better this time around for me uh, is really exciting and I'm Really thrilled to share my quote with you. So thanks to Heather for sharing that story and and for saying, you know, um, you can't see it in the quilt, but there, there is a story there. So I, I hope that um, these are just a few examples of the kinds of stories that come with every quilt, even if it's a kit quilt for a, a new niece or nephew or a really elaborate um, conceptual art quilt. Uh, I think it's a, it's maybe a corny metaphor, but uh, in the same way we layer fabric to make quilts, quilts certainly have layers of stories and they will continue to accrue stories throughout their life. Um, and whether it's the maker or the recipient or the one that's remembered in the quilt, all those stories are embedded there. And um, I think every quilt does have a backstory. It's, it's sometimes that it's, it was collaborative. It was, it had an inspiration that's been transformed. Um, all those things are embedded in quilts. So, I mean, I think about the quilt we talked about in the beginning that had inscriptions from 14 different young women on it and Susanna, their Sunday school teacher, and we can't see those inscriptions anymore. Those voices are basically, without the documentation, they're lost. Um, but because someone took the time to transcribe it, photograph it, save the letters of the soldiers who saw this quilt and were moved by this quilt, um, we can hear those stories again. And I think that's really, it's powerful. Because um, you, you never know, your quilt might survive another 157 years, just like this one has, it's, it's possible. Um, and there are just as many, if not more, quilt stories happening today as there were in 1863. Um, Making a video obviously is not the only way to preserve these stories, um, but we think it's a really human and vivid way to do it. Um, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel if you're interested. We have more than 650 quilt stories collected so far through Go Tell It at the Quilt Show. Um, they are all over the country. I think we have a few, a handful from um, outside of the United States as well. 
And you can also learn a little bit more about making your own Go Tell It at the Quilt Show video. Anyone can make one and you can submit it to us. It's a great thing to do with a group or guild. We have full instructions on our website with tips and um, kind of the basic framework, but there are very few rules. All you really need is a camera, your quilt, and three minutes. Um, Amy, our executive director, made hers, I think, by propping her phone up on a yoga mat. So no big equipment, and then you just hit record. So we are, um, can't wait to hear how you're documenting your quilt stories. I hope this has given you a little bit of an idea about why we think the documentation and preserving quilt stories is really so essential. So thanks so much. Thank you, Emma. That was fantastic. Um, I just love it. And I love that um, every time I see these videos, I've seen many of them many times, I, guess I, I come away with something different and uh, relate to it in a different way, depending on what's going on in my life. And I hope that's true for the rest of you. If you we're just going to pause for about uh, 20 seconds right now and allow you to add questions to the Q&A box or comments, feedback, thoughts, um, hellos in the chat box. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Uh, so let's pause for just one minute, but stay tuned because Emma's going to answer questions. And I've got three tips for you uh, that are um, non-negotiable. Let's see so many great uh, comments. Um, so many old friends popping up and new friends and that's just great. We're so glad to have this opportunity. This is just, this was a fantastic idea that came from uh, Leslie Levy at the International Quilt Museum, I believe. And uh, Martha Seelman has done a big job of coordinating. So let's move on to the tips. And uh, Emma, if you'll go to the next one. Uh, as Emma showed us, these quilts are undisputably historical documents. Have you ever thought about a quilt as a document? Um, well, it is in, in a lot of ways. It contains important information about the life and the times of the maker, their family, and their world. And we don't want that story to fade away with the last person who knew that story. Uh, because as she said, quilts often outlive their maker or owner. So here are three key steps that every quilt owner should take to keep their quilt's history from fading away. I'm not going to make you take the labeling pledge as we often do, but we'll just assume that you're going to, uh, after this call, go and label your quilts, number one and don't be picky about it. Be as archival as you can at minimum, uh, include the maker's name, the date completed, the location made, and the maker or the owner's contact information. Very important. You don't want a, that quilt to be lost or taken and never be able to reunite with its owner. Take photos of your quilt is number two, and I'm talking about an overall photo, front and back, uh, and then a photo with the maker or owner. That um, adds context to the documentation of that quilt. It's an important detail. It also uh, says something about scale, doesn't it? Um, and several details include a photo of the label on the quilt. And you can get extra credit for yourself and your family if you make a Go Tell It video. And there's easy go, uh, do it yourself instructions on the website. If you have a cell phone or a, um, a um, laptop, I mean a um, tablet, you can do this. It is so easy and Emma's instructions are excellent. And you can upload it to your own YouTube, you can keep it for posterity, or you can share it with us and we'll put it with the, the rest of the collection on YouTube. And the last one is write down that story. You know it, that doesn't mean your family knows it. The quilt behind me was made for my daughter and in my Go Tell It, I talk about how it was made for her when she was a baby. And then she walked in while I was watching it and she said, wait a minute, that's my quilt? So, you know, I had never, I had not labeled it. I'm just whispering, I had never but I did label it right after that. And I put a QR code to the video so that she'll also always be able to connect with that video. And then I wrote down on a sheet of paper that I also backed up on my computer, additional physical details, the size, the fiber content, the materials, how to care for it, 
how to care for it may seem like a no-brainer, but it's important. Uh, the history of the maker, the purpose of the quilt, uh, the influence or the inspiration. So all these are so important. Um, and I pledge to do it and I hope you will. Um, Emma, do you wanna go on to the next one and then we'll start. Sure, um, absolutely. I wanna to get to the questions, but if you enjoyed this presentation, there's more. We're having a virtual event in late September, the 25th and 26th of September. We are um, converting our Quilters Take Manhattan event to Quilters Take a Moment this year. Um, and it is uh, gonna be such a great event with speakers and interviews and go tell it's just like this. And we hope you'll join us. So you can find out all about it on our website, quiltalliance.org. And you can also see, uh, there's also links there to the Go Tell It's, to the other textile talks, um, and just tons and tons of information, including QSOS, which Emma also mentioned. Um, Emma, I'm gonna turn it back to you with some questions. Are you sure. able to see the Q&A or shall I ask you? I, I don't you, think you, you can. Perhaps you should ask me because I <laughs> okay. thought I could figure out how to bring it up, but maybe I can't. Okay, great. And yeah. I'll, I'll co-answer them with this you. This will be, I'll do them blind. So uh, Becky Glasby at the National Court okay. Museum. Hi, Becky. Hi. Um, she asked, how do we set up a day to film stories in our areas or museums or libraries? Thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. So um, we, when things were easier to travel, we did have a program called um, Quilt Story Roadshow, where we visited, we meaning um, either Amy or me or, or both of us, um, I, Amy and I, uh, <laughs> visited uh, groups and guilds who wanted to have us come as a speaker and do a documentation day. Um, we are experimenting also with ways to make that digital. We have, that's sort of yet to, to structure, but I think in this day and age, it could be really interesting and fun, um, especially when we can't travel. But um, we also would be happy to work with you, I think, and, and figure out ways to make it. It's so simple. I mean, the, there's the equipment needed really, as Amy said, is at this point, a cell phone, I think is almost better than the video camera we invested in early on. Um, and, uh, to set up a day where people come and bring their quilts. Um, maybe there's a quilt appraiser in your community who might be willing to donate their time or, or work for a fee. I don't want to ask anyone to work for free. But um, so that's a really great question because I think you will often find, especially when you have events like this in a non-quilt space, um, just how many members of your community do have amazing quilts. But, but also in obviously a quilt museum or other textile center. Um, it's a great place to do it because you've already got the expertise in the setup. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, we're doing some, that I, I um, was answering a question, but we're also doing some that are uh, virtual. Yeah. Um, getting ready to do those virtually. So uh, contact us. Q Emma, do you want to go on to the next one? So it oh, shows sure. your uh, contact info in case. Yeah. We're there we Happy are. to answer any questions and you can visit us for a, a lot more information. Um, Emma, the next one's from Francis P Perry. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your right name correctly, um, P-A-R-R-Y. She says, for a textile artist, you have suggestions for documenting the stories behind our work, such as archiving, documenting, et cetera. Yeah. So I think some of those tips that Amy already mentioned are essential. I mean, the very first thing to do is to write it down. Um, you don't even have to record yourself, although I think that's really essential. Write it down, keep it with the work, keep a copy not with the work, just in case. And I think sometimes we, um, this doesn't just sort of touch on robust documentation, but I know I don't often sometimes label because I feel like I'm going to do it wrong. There's, there's no way to do it wrong. There's absolutely no way. I mean, you're not going to ruin the quilt. I know this is controversial. Um, and you're, you can't make a mistake by putting too little information. You don't have to put every single thing we just mentioned on there. You should put as much as you can and feel comfortable with, but it's really, I mean, inspiring to know how much um, a historian can get just from um, a few pieces of information. I'm not saying that you should skimp, but I'm also saying that um, don't fear it, <laughs> go for it, do as much as you can, even if it's just labeling one. Um, we really encourage people to, to label not only the quilts that they've made, but the quilts that they've inherited, the quilts that they've purchased, the quilts that friends have made for them. Um, I think as an artist, writing about your process and writing um, 
making notes is really, really important and keeping it with the quilt. Um, a lot of people, if they have sort of voluminous documentation, um, keep a binder, which I think is a really, or a journal, um, an interesting practice to start if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, I think those are, those are great places to start. I think it really depends on what you feel like is essential to share. Because sometimes people, I think, are very focused on their um, particular artistic process, their technique. I think that's essential to document for some people. For others, it's sort of inspiration or where your work fits in in a historical arc. Um, so I think taking some time to think about what you think is the story of those quilts and what you want to sort of be left behind is really, um, it's worth it. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, um, fantastic, Emma. Um, Colleen Brester asked, how does a Quilt Guild obtain Quilt Alliance's permission to show this video presentation to our Quilt Guild members? Email us and yep. we would be happy to um, put something together for you or, you know, even visit virtually if we could figure that out. Um, but definitely write to us and we'll be happy to figure anything out. Um, we have 650 videos on our YouTube channel, like I mentioned. You're welcome to show those anytime. We don't um, the owners retain the copyright to the quilts and the videos, but we'd be happy if you wanted to share any of them. Um, and Michelle Jackson asks, uh, or says, a few years ago when Sakwa Textile Posters was at Houston, we did an audio of our quilt. Was that through you or question mark? That, uh, that was, did you do those go tell it? If it was, um, if it was an audio recording, I think there was a year where the Sakwa exhibit maybe had, um, you could call in and that oh. was through the exhibit. That may have been that year. I know that the year that there was um, silver was the theme, we did do some go tell -its. I'm trying to think if we did the posters. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think we'll so. Yeah. Yeah. I think if it was audio only and not video. That would have been. Um, probably not us. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bridget Red asked, does the Quilt Alliance accept written stories of quilts produced in the 20th century along with any pictures? So right now we're mostly collecting, um, we have two projects. One is an oral history project that's an audio project that's called QSOS. Um, we're pausing on collecting new interviews right now as we re-envision what that looks like. Um, when it started, we were collecting interviews on cassette tape. So obviously the technology has um, evolved a little bit. And this video project, so we don't have the capacity to accept like physical documentation. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah. Um, what if the, I say, let's, sorry, Constance Duffy asked what kind of camera was used to find the invisible writing on the Civil War era quilt? It was Ooh. a fascinating story. Great question. That is a good question. Um, I actually tried to find the answer to that. The information that I shared about that quilt came from um, the, web, there's a web page about this quilt on the American, the Museum of American History's website. So um, I can actually, I'll find it in just a minute and share I'll it look, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. I'll I mean, if you just look up that. Susanna Pullen quilt, I think it's the first thing. Okay, I'll do it. Um, and they have a number of close up photos. And there is an article written. Also, um, Barbara Brackman has a post about this quilt on her Civil War quilts blog. And in that, um, there's a volunteer at the museum named, Vic I think her name is Victoria. I'm going to get this wrong and she's going to be on the call or something, but Victoria Eisenman, if you know her, I'm sorry if I'm getting this name wrong, it's her memory. And she mentioned that the special photographs had been taken, but did not say what kind. I'm imagining it's probably a high contrast image lit in a specific way, or perhaps like a um, UV lighting that they did. There is also an article um, in Uncoverings written by Virginia, I think, not Victoria, maybe. I could be wrong. We'll share the link um, about the quilt, and she may have more specific information. So I wish I knew that. I would love to. Um, I'm putting those really links amazing. in the chat box, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, and then this is an interesting question. So um, Mary Walter says, what if the quilt is a well-known commercial pattern rather than an original design? We want to hear about it. I still think, yeah, that's a... Um, I think that those those quilts also have stories and um, we would be, I think, are equally worthy of documentation. Our whole slogan is that we are interested in all quilts and quilt makers. A lot of these videos were filmed um, 
at quilt shows just because that's an easy way to collect a whole lot of quilt stories at once and that's where we have typically traveled. But I personally am especially interested in quilts that are not in quilt shows, that are quilts that we've made for families, quilts that are from patterns. Um, you know, I think even, even the choices you make to make a, a patterned quilt, um, you know, is, is a different, and your hand is visible there and your reason for making it, I think is, is, is really, and choosing that pattern, um, yeah. I think it's, it's all, for us, it's all worthy. Um, we are interested in every single quilt, even if it's, it's your very first one. Yes, quilt story democracy. Yeah. Um, does anyone, uh, this is from Janet Marnie, does anyone still sell the computer chips to insert in quilts to prevent theft and aid in recovery of lost or stolen quilts? I do not know. Do you, Emma? I do not know. In fact, I have never heard of that, but I wonder, it sounds like you're, it's like microchipping your quilt. Um, I wonder if someone does still sell that. Yeah. Um, if anyone knows. That would be uh, good to know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a note to look this up because I'd love it to learn more. Because yeah. we'd love to share it. Um, yeah. I found a, something on the quilting board. I'm going to put that link in, but I don't have time to look over it. But good question, um, Janet. Um, Patricia um, Taylor, this wasn't really our area, but she's asking what is the availability regarding receiving a degree or certificate in textual studies, fiber arts here in the USA, preferably online. I don't think that we could answer that, but maybe some of our friends in uh, some of our attendees might have a question. Certainly the University of Nebraska at Lincoln has an excellent program. They're one of our partners here. And um, I'm sure there, there are many, so I'm not excluding your program if I don't mention it. But um, uh, the next one is from Kathleen uh, McCabe. Does having this information on a website count as documentation? I think it does. Yeah, I would also, you know, I mean, the, the thing about a website is that they do sometimes go away. So it's, there is nothing truly that can beat a good old hard copy, but um, yeah, that totally counts. I mean, I think the thing is to share the story widely, even if it's not the most permanent I mean, obviously we hope that there's a lasting way to keep that information around. Um, Cause there are so many quilts that we see them and just think, God, I wish I knew. Um, but, but definitely, yeah, a website is a great way to, to document those stories. And um, these days it's so easy. Um, right. Yeah, it's a great. Um, if you're documenting a quilt, uh, Sally uh, May Hancox reminds, if you're documenting a quilt, be sure to use archival paper. Yes. Good idea. And Tracy Metheny says, should the label be attached before or after the quilting? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. I think a lot of people do quilt in the label. I think it makes it much more secure. It's not gonna be removed either accidentally or by nefarious types. Um, I don't think that's that common, but just in case. Um, it's certainly, I mean, it is an aesthetic question about how you feel about that label. I love to have it be a piece as part of the back or the front. I mean, we have certainly seen historical quilts where the entire quilt is the label. Right. I mean, it's just a huge sort of panel with that person's name and information. And I think like, what better way to do it? Um, I think for longevity, quilting it in is, is a, a fantastic idea. Absolutely, more secure. Here's a question from this. I'm going from the chat uh, room now, and it says, um, it's a question from Sharon Eastvold, and it says, is there a fee for submitting a video, or do we need to belong to your organization? No. Um, we accept videos from anyone. We are a membership organization and would be delighted to have anyone who wants to support our work, um, but submitting a video is totally free. We're happy to offer help if you have questions for free. There's no, there's no fee at all. Um, we are, we hope we can get a story about every single quilt that exists in the world. Uh, we'll get there eventually, but um, we'd, we'd love to have yours, even if you're not a Quilt Alliance member. Yeah, but we do appreciate membership because that supports everything we do. You can also uh, underwrite or sponsor a QSOS interview for $25. You can put your name as the underwriter for a QSOS interview, but that's a great question. Um, let me move up back up and see if I see any other questions, but we're right at three o'clock. So I think that was the last question. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. 
Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Emma, for making a wonderful presentation. Thank and so much. thank you to Lucy at Sakwa for helping us as our producer, unseen producer. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much.